Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners, and welcome to this week's podcast. And this week's podcast, well, it's it's voices and emails from listeners. We asked for reactions to the pandemic, what's going on in your community, what you're doing, how it's affecting your life. And the one thing that I took away from it from you, Clay, was this optimistic view that now is a chance for us to wallow in self-improvement, if that's an okay way to put it. Yes. this I, have a, I, I think I speak for millions of people when I say I have an enforced sabbatical at home. I'm going to look on it as a sabbatical. I have some very severe economic concerns. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm going to have to reinvent my work to a certain degree. And by the way, if you love the Jefferson Hour and you have uh, the wherewithal to help us, this would be a great time because we don't take any personal money from it, but the program needs to continue. It's a voice of reason at a very critical moment in American life. But but let me let me go back to the to the idea of the sabbatical. I'm home. There's nowhere I can go. I'm not getting on a plane for weeks and maybe months. It could be a year. You're uh, unemployed. You're uh, not completely unemployed, but your entire performance schedule and lecture series, they're all done until your your hope is, and I thought this was really important. The Lewis and Clark trip was on. Lewis and Clark People trip should is not on. despair of that. They can drive to the to the to Great Falls if they need to. That trip is in the safest and, place and in also, the world. And you, you also, talk, you talk in the uh, program, and there's details in there, and people can go to jeffersonhour.com to donate, to comment, to send us a message, but also to find out details. Are you going to do some online lecture series? Online courses. There are actually interactive online courses with chat rooms and video lectures. and That's going to be and, great. And, and live That's meetings. That's ambitious. It is, but it's important because this is people are in their homes, and they want to connect. And we have a, we have a marvelous tool unprecedented in human history to connect outside of the safety of your house to a larger world. And and I believe so strongly, I mean, I, I can't tell you how strongly I believe that the humanities must be central to this. We have to place this. I'm putting air quotes around place. We have to place this moment in the larger context of pandemics, of the history of, of disease, of the history of science, of the literature, of human uh, struggles and catastrophes. There's a great pandemic literature. The more you look into it, the larger it grows, uh, beginning with uh, the great uh, book by Daniel Defoe, Journal of the Plague Year, from a fictionalized account of, of, a, of a report about the plague in London in 1665. The humanities are central to this. And I'm going to do that course, a pandemics course. It'll be, I think, four sessions. And then I'm going to do a much more ambitious course on what is the Enlightenment and why does it matter? Because now more than ever, we need to be thinking about it. And so many people tell me when I see them on the road, David, they say, you talk about the Enlightenment. What exactly do you mean by that? Because, of course, Enlightenment is a general term, but it also is a specific term like Renaissance or Scientific Revolution or Reformation. And so this course will be probably eight or nine weeks. We'll read a number of the great texts, including Stephen Pinker's book on the Enlightenment and, and um, Yuval Harari's Homo Deus, but also um, Peter Gay's fabulous two-volume account of the historic Enlightenment, which is one of the great books uh, written during the 20th century. So watch for those. They'll be on the Jefferson Hour site. Also, all of the, the cultural tours are on, beginning with Lewis and Clark. We're planning something for the fall, but but particularly there's um, Steinbeck in March, there's Cuba in February, and the two retreats at Loxo Lodge in January. That's the other now, word. Yeah. This is so all yeah. coming. I believe, and I'm an optimist, and so that's where we started. I believe that I'm, I'm with Yuval Harari. If, if you want to cheer up Read Homo Deus, and I'm reading it critically because because he may be wrong. But what he says is that science, technology, and the digital revolution are breathtaking. We have no idea how extraordinary they are, and they are going to get on top of this, just as we did Ebola and every other um, pandemic of, of the swine flu and every other pandemic of the last thirty or forty years. That humans are uniquely capable now of getting on top of whatever is thrown at us in an unprecedentedly sophisticated, humane, and thorough way, and that we need to re we need to retain our Jeffersonian optimism in the face of this. I go from, I don't know about you, David, I really want to hear what you think, but I go from fear and loathing and trembling and <laughs> self-pity and, and panic to 
elation, sometimes in the same day, sometimes in the same hour. Are you having wild mood swings about this? I'm trying to keep busy because of the nature of the place that I work. We we closed our front doors um, 10 days ago or better. We're not doing any public sessions until this thing sort of settles out and we see where things this are. This is a recording studio for people. Right. Uh, people come in to record music and and and, and Well, there's so many things. So you know, on. one of the things we're doing now, uh, a lot of, is um, restoration of uh, audio archives. For Native Americans. Well, particularly uh, a couple of Native American colleges, which I have the greatest respect for. Uh, tribal colleges are, are, that's a long story. They're There's amazing. a lifeline in the world. Yeah, and they're, you know, center of communities and stuff. But also now we're working with uh, the North Dakota State Historical Society and doing some restoration for them. So that's the kind of thing where you you don't have public contact. I suspect we'll be able to keep some of that going, but on the other hand, you know, a third of our annual work uh, just disappeared over the summer, so it'll be tight. It'll be tough. Your garden will be already. I'm guessing you're going to start planting tomatoes. I already have. I already have. Uh, one of the things uh, when I talk to Pat is she's got some new seeds. Pat Brodowski of Monticello. She's got some new seeds, tomatoes from the Galapagos Islands, native to that. So you want to hear an interesting stark fact that when after the bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the United States in 1946 went into a long series of tests. And they decided finally to do those tests at the at the atolls near the Marshall Islands in the Pacific, including Bikini. One of the places on the short list for those detonations was the Galapagos. Can you imagine that? That we nearly we nearly bombed the Galapagos to test nuclear devices in the aftermath. But in the I mean, it's, it's not that it's so much better that we did to the islanders. The, the the islanders of, of the Bikini Atoll, but we did. But I just read this week in a book about the, the roll-up to uh, the nuclear confrontations of the 1960s that the Galapagos were on the short list. I, one of my dreams is to go to Hiroshima. I think every American who can should go to Auschwitz or Dachau or to Hiroshima. Probably the dream of all of our podcast listeners is that we get to the show. You but know, before I don't we know. Do, I think people are bored and are eager to hear <laughs> maybe, even our kind of pattern. We we had intended to do one show with uh, viral voices, uh, people come coming to us with their their uh, emails or their voicemails, and there's so many of them, and we didn't really get through all of them. Particularly, um, Catherine's report from the UK, which is in an early part of the show, I'm, people are going to enjoy a lot. And again, Pat Burdowski talked. Uh, Nancy Frankie, my my, um, my handler, Scott Davis, and and uh, Brad Chrysler, but there's a bunch more. So we're going to do this again next week, even though some of them might be a little dated. Who knows what's going to happen? Well, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better, and then it's going to get better before the world ends. Let's go to the show. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. A bit of a a different different Thomas Jefferson Hour. Um, We've decided to turn the show over this week to the voices of our listeners. Do you want to explain to them, Clay? Well, like every other entity in the country, our fixation is on the coronavirus. At this point, nobody knows quite how sweeping it will be, what its death rate will be, how many Americans will be infected, how many people worldwide will be infected, whether the economy will survive or collapse whether the social structure will begin to collapse, as sometimes it does when there is a, an international crisis. So I think almost everyone is looking for calm, for reason, for science, for truth. And the Jefferson Hour exists to, uh, to spread the good news of the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment teaches us that humans are resilient that they get through crises like this and that there are ways to cope uh, that do not lead to undue fear or, or panic. And, and so you called me the other day. And we're both essentially sequestering ourselves in our homes, which is the right thing to do on, on an occasion like this. And you suggested that we, we check in with our far-flung world of correspondence in the United States and elsewhere and, and, and get a sense from them of how they're coping. 
And they responded, and I made some calls, we got some calls, we got a lot of emails, we'll get to as many of them as we can, but one of the first calls I made was to your lovely daughter, Catherine, who is at this point, um, I don't know if I want to say stuck in the UK, but she's there. Well, she's decided to stay, so you can imagine that we have had some very long conversations. She's talking to both parents and trying to decide what's the right thing to do because, of course, if this turned into a kind of apocalyptic uh, pandemic, the last thing you want to do is to be trapped across a 3,000-mile ocean when you can't possibly then get home. On the other hand, if this turns out to be a relatively moderate blip, why would you necessarily come to the United States that doesn't have a national health care system when you're in Britain, which does? There are so many things to weigh. When I when we talk about it, I keep saying to her, the ground is shifting under our argument. We can't even have an hour-long <laughs> conversation before the conditions have changed and new data comes in, new fears, new airports are closed, um, revelations come about possible vaccines. One Oxford college after the next, there are 37 of them, have been shutting down. The libraries are closed. She's had a hard time even getting such staples as bread uh, and rice in the the shops of Oxford. And so for the moment, she's there. Who knows? By the time this airs, she may have come home. You haven't heard this conversation. No, I wanted it to be between the two of you. And it was. And uh, she touches on all the things that you just mentioned. So I'm eager, I'm eager to hear. Let's take a listen. Catherine, for people who don't know, uh, tell us where you are. I'm living in Oxford, England. And uh, I'm not really able to get home. I, I could theoretically get home, but it, it would be very difficult. And so for the time being, at least, I am staying put here. Oxford is essentially a ghost town now. Everybody has been advised to leave. All uh, British undergraduates and graduates have been forced to leave. And even some international students have been told by their respective colleges that even though their colleges know they have nowhere to go and can't get home. They can't stay here. So it's been very interesting. I'm sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop for my college to kick me out of my apartment. But uh, I'm, I'm not sure what I'll do then. I'll try to stay with friends or or something. So it's it's been very interesting. But uh, people are very calm here, uh, with the exception of in the grocery stores, where it's been absolute madness, as it has been, as I understand it. And, and the United States, too. People uh, stocking up on, on essentials and that sort of thing? Absolutely. No toilet paper, no paper towels, no uh, canned food, no pasta, no rice. And just in the past couple of days, no bread, which has been very interesting. And there's a waiting list for a local bakery that you can get on to try to, try to get a fresh loaf of bread. Uh, but uh, I've been in the shops every single day. And it's been, it's been very startling. I've never seen anything like it in my lifetime. You're not going to starve or anything, are you? Oh, no. I mean, there may not be bread, but there is ice cream. So, What about the, uh, the impression we all have of the British and their stiff upper lip? Well, I think that that holds true. I mean, on one hand, the UK government has had the, the smallest reaction of any European country, any G8 country, I guess. It's... It's been hesitant to put in place restrictions. Only on Monday did we get the information that we should avoid big groups and avoid pubs and things like that. But for the most part, almost everything is open. There are some dress shops that are closed and uh, a few a few places that are have limited hours. And just yesterday, the Bodleian Library closed indefinitely. But the grocery stores are open. Restaurants are open, coffee shops are open, and there are tons of people on the street. I mean, I'm, I've been surprised to see how many people are on the street and some wearing masks, but mostly just going about their normal business. And uh, we'll see what happens next. It was just advised that anyone who is immunocompromised or elderly is supposed to stay home for 12 weeks in self-isolation. But otherwise... 12 weeks? 12 12 weeks. Wow. So groups are forming to do grocery delivery and things like that. But uh, so far, we've been told the only need to self-isolate should be if if you have symptoms. And if you have symptoms, you're not meant to call the NHS, not meant to go to the hospital, uh, 
not meant to get a test and just to stay where you are to, to save hospital beds for those with the most severe cases. We're talking to you and it's March 18th and by the time this is on the air, who knows what will have changed. Absolutely. It's changing every single day. A week ago, I knew that coronavirus was coming and there was a case uh, in Oxford, but I could not have foreseen this. It's, uh, it's, I feel like um, I've, I'm looking at the world with different eyes. It's it's shocking. As of today, do you know how many active cases there are in the UK? That's a really interesting question. From what I've been reading, there have only been 2,000 confirmed cases via COVID tests, but they stopped testing people about a week ago. And so the estimates are that there are more than 200,000 who currently have coronavirus, but there's no way to accurately track these numbers since they aren't testing. So how accurate that number is, I'm not sure, but uh, it's certainly growing. Well, that's that's terrifically different than what's happening in the U.S. Here, there's this mad rush to get enough testing, but in the U.K., they've stopped testing. Do you, do you have any uh, understanding of why they, they decided to do that? I think, on one hand, a lack of tests, but also sort of just the feeling of being resigned that it is going to affect eight to 10 Britons and that the best strategy is not to test, but rather to, to, to try to keep other people from getting it who are the most vulnerable members of the population. Now, you said eight out of 10 they expect will get it? That's the number that I saw today, although other numbers I've seen have said six to seven out of 10. So that's a big variation, but uh, it seems more than half of the population will be affected, at least in some way. You said earlier that you kind of looked at this as the world was all different. I mean, can you can you talk more about that? Well, I don't know. It's hard to remember life before coronavirus. I don't know. I feel like I I was very naive about the possible effects and thought of it in sort of Zika terms or, or swine flu. And now I'm wondering when I'll next be able to see my family and if I could get home if I needed to. I'm coming from a very privileged um, place of just thinking about that as opposed to some people are wondering how they're going to pay their rent or freelancers are in a lot of trouble or, or any number of, of uncertainties right now, uh, economic or, or public health wise. But I I just have been so shocked by the developments of each day that I can't believe that in the past few weeks, I thought that this was going to be something small that wouldn't really affect the global population to the extent that it has been. And I was blissfully ignorant and now just waiting for what's going to happen next. I spoke with your father earlier today, and uh, I know how concerned he is. Um, as we all are, uh, you, your intention at this point is to stay in place or is your intention to do everything you can to get back to the United States? My intention right now is to stay in place and that's been my intention. But yesterday I had something close to a panic attack with all the talk about the borders closing and not being able to get back to the United States for an uncertain period of time. And I was really scared and, and I spoke to both of my parents and to, and to friends and, and tried to get advice. At this point, I still believe that it is it makes more sense to hunker down than it does when I, kn I know I've been exposed uh, to the virus because I know people who have been infected and have been around them. And it seems wrong to get on a plane and come to middle America to a place that has been largely unaffected so far, although there have been cases, and potentially be kind of a patient zero uh, on the Great Plains. And so that's my greatest hesitation. It's the, a, a terrible feeling to wonder if, if I don't act now, will I not be able to get home? And I had no plans to come home uh, anytime soon, but it's it's something about the borders closing really 
it creates a feeling of a, li- of, of a little bit of panic. Bless you. And uh, I, I, I really hope you uh, pull through this okay. And I have a feeling you will. You're quite resilient. I'm sure you'll do all right. But at the same time, it's no fun. Oh, thank you. Well, you too. Godspeed to you. Thanks a lot, Catherine. You bet. Oh, my, David. Um, this is the first time, of course, I've heard that conversation. I'm glad that you had it yourself. A couple of things. The first time I've ever heard Catherine on this program without any snark. Uh, that's a nice uh, development. <laughs> she mentions ice cream. She told me that the thing that she would most want if it could be imported is Cherry Garcia, which apparently is not for sale at any price at any time, not just during the pandemic. Uh, she asked me if I'd send her a loaf of bread. I don't know the logistics <laughs> of that. We need to, do, to take a, a, a short break, and we'll be back. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Clay Jenkinson here, out of tights this week. And we're talking about the pandemic with the help of our listeners scattered around the country and even around the world. That was my daughter, Catherine Missouri Walker Jenkinson, who is at Oxford University and apparently staying. I can give you a couple of updates, David, since you recorded that. The restaurants and the coffee shops have closed. The British government has said that people should not gather in groups larger than two. So that pretty much ends any public gathering. But here's what I want to say that's so important to me. My daughter didn't say this, of course, but she has been delivering food and drugs and soap and detergent and paper towels, if you can get them, and other things to friends of hers around Oxford who have been quarantined. And they are sort of stuck in their digs in their rooms or their small apartments. And she has been carrying these care packages around, you know, at some risk to herself and finding it. And this, I think, is the most important point, finding it enormously satisfying to instead of sitting around wringing your hands and feeling anxiety to get out and to help somebody else to ease the burden of those who are sequestered and uh, it's you know in a sense this is her 4-h <laughs> training from back in Kansas really paying off in the world and I, I'm enormously satisfied and proud of her and moved by that sort of Florence Nightingale um, impulse that she has you should be and uh, as always quite impressed with your daughter there's many more calls but let's do another one that's close to the Jefferson hour and that would be Nancy. Frankie, oh, she's my scheduler and handler. And uh-huh. uh, speaking of snark, I, I I don't know what you had to say with her either, but I can't wait to hear it. Hi, I'm Nancy Frankie. I'm from Snohomish, Washington. Snohomish is is about um, probably ten miles north where Ground Zero started, the nursing home where the the COVID virus was first uh, discovered out here, and. We're all kind of, you know, in in a, in a limbo state like the rest of the country is out here, but it seemed to hit us a lot faster. Our stores, of course, uh, I seem to be the ones that started the big toilet paper run. I myself actually stocked up on wine because the stores started to have these great sales on things. And I figure if, if I'm going to be stuck at home and not feeling uh, so great, I'm I'm going to go down with a smile on my face. So our one local store here did uh, tell everyone that if you want any sort of paper products or bread to get there at when the store opens at 6 o'clock in the morning, which I did. That's the first time I've ever been to the store that early since Black Friday, and it was just about as hectic. That is sort of where we are. Our, our, our uh, restaurants are all closed. The bars are closed. Um, I live in a little town where there are as many bars as there are churches, and the churches are closed as well. So we hear it on the news, of course, all the time with um, with the different with the outbreaks. We're trying to be careful, but it seems kind of surreal unless you actually know someone who has this virus and is sick with it. It's like preparing for a snowstorm that just isn't here yet and so we're still uh we're still all trying to be cautious and and trying to to uh, make the best of everything um but we do know that our hospitals here are absolutely full 
So that's where we are in little Snohomish, Washington, at the foot of the Cascade Mountains, hoping that this passes soon. Um, and if it doesn't, I've decided to make another run to the store today um, for necessary supplies, which would be Oreos and wine this time. <laughs> wow. How do we cope? A couple of things about this. First of all, Nancy is a is an outstanding um, friend of mine and employee, and has been now for for more than twenty years. This she you know was really close to the epicenter of this when it first really popped above the radar in the United States. It was from that precise area of Washington State. Now the epicenter in this country has moved to New York City. But she's like many of the callers. You know, it's very very serious, and we all take it that way. But there's a sense of humor and a sense of community that seems to pop out from a lot of these. We're Americans. You know, there's, there's, an, there's a, a deep anarchic optimism at the very center of the American spirit. We, of all the people in the world, we have this kind of crazy anarchy of I'm going to respond in the way that I'm going to respond, and I, I'm going to figure this out for myself, and and I'm going to have gallows humor. But but we're optimists, David, at the core. And this goes back to, of course, the great Jefferson, the first fabulous optimist in American history, that we are equal to anything, that life will go on, that we need to be pretty skeptical about everything that we're hearing, and that we need to make up our minds for ourselves, and we will indeed uh, power through this. I love that spirit. But you can also hear both in my daughter's voice and in Nancy Frankie's voice some anxiety. You can hear that that optimism is being tested. And so the question is, is it going to be tested right to the right to the concrete? Or is this going to be the fundamental crisis of the 21st century for the United States and the world? Or is this going to be Ebola on steroids, worse than Ebola, but not cataclysmic. And I don't think we know the answer to that yet. And that's why people are hoarding, because they're they're rationally thinking, okay, maybe I have to be a little bit of a jerk to get my beans and toilet paper today. But what if three weeks from now, there aren't beans to be had at any price anywhere? That's what people are concerned about. I need to read an email to you from this stack. It comes from, and you'll understand why I should read it, Amy Jo Townley, who listens on WHRV. She, she's a frequent uh, yeah, contributor you, you to this read a, you read a luxury of patience letter of right. hers sometime ago. Anyway, she writes, I was one of the fortunate 900 who saw Clay's performance. While Clay may have disinfecting wipes with him always, I must tattle. He touched his face constantly through the, throughout the performance. We were aware of the coronavirus at that point and were receiving warnings to wash our hands and not touch our face. I thought, poor Clay is doomed. I only hope that I've alerted him in time. You see what's in my hand. Yes, I do. I have wet ones. These are the Tropical Splash kills 99% of germs wet ones. We've moved to the studio to do the show today, and there was some concern about us both being in the same place, but we were practicing social distancing and being very cautious, and it may be that uh, we end up doing this remote in weeks to come, depending on the fate of our own health. Well, when you hear my Jefferson Watch essay this week, um, I'll talk about this a little bit. You know, we are so fortunate that this pandemic is occurring in the digital era. Imagine just for a second what this would be like in 1990 before the internet. People are, are able to have entertainment. They're able to connect with their loved ones and friends around the world. Uh, email travels without um, any physical contact. We have access to a million books or more, um, not only the ones you pay for uh, on Amazon Prime or, 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 or anything else you might have, but we have free books beyond measure. As you know, you're a great user of free online books. Uh, we can work from home in a way that has probably never been possible in the history of the world before. And so I think this is going to really be a revolution. 
It's going to change American society. It's for, going to change the know. world in some important ways, and it's going to be made possible. You know, we've been we've been messing around with the internet. You know, there are a lot of porn sites, a lot of stupid fake news and memes and cat postings and so on. We, we've been messing around with the internet for a long time and using underusing it, using it for in, in vulgar, silly, narcissistic and and um, and illicit ways. This gives us a chance. This gives us a chance to take it seriously. We've talked about that in the past and how Jefferson would utilize oh the inter- the internet for its informational value, and it would just his head would explode. I think you said at one point. Well, think of it. I mean, so people are saying, isolate yourself. You know, the best thing you can do for the next X, X weeks, X months, is to cocoon in your home and to make as few forays into the larger world as absolutely necessary and to avoid uh, groups of all sorts, but really to avoid physical contact between the people that you know and love that you, that you automatically are going to be with. How is that going to be possible? It's going to be possible because of the Internet. Now, people can read, people can knit, or there are all sorts of things that people can do. But the Internet means that... We, we can do it with less pain. And, and we know things. So when I was at Oxford in the, ni- in the, mid-19- in the late 1970s, I only called home a couple of times per year. It was very cumbersome, very expensive, very inconvenient. You often had to be in a smelly um, little telephone booth uh, where people... I don't want to go into great detail, but people um, spend get, nights we there, the, etc. The yeah. And so, if this had happened then, my parents would have been beside themselves with anxiety. Well, think of think of Jefferson's time, you know, and, and trying to get a message across the ocean. So. Yeah, in Jefferson's time, people began their letters by saying. You know, dear David, I hope you're fine. I hope Not you're still alive. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, literally, they checked in on who was still alive and who had died, who had been born, because the the the, the amount of distance, both in time and geography, between correspondences was huge then. And now I can I can watch not only hear my daughter's voice every day free by the way, although somebody's paying for it. Yep. But I can I can look at her expression. I can I can study her body language. Her physiognomy, her facial expressions, whether she looks tired, whether she looks ill, whether she looks happy, whether she's panicking, I can see that and not just hear it, and it makes all the difference in the world. So I think we're this is going to be the age when the Internet grows up. Well, speaking of the Internet, um, there's a couple of Facebook pages that are connected to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. One, I think, is pretty much run by us. The other are fans of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, which is very popular. But um, when we called for people to report in, there were a number of, of posts on Facebook. Would, would, you, would you share a few of those with us? Certainly. Here's one from Greg Stillman. It's been terrible. Too much time for reading, for thinking and reflection. Too many gin games where my wife beats me without mercy. Too much time for walks along the shore in an ancient maritime forest. Too much time to experiment with new food and wine. Too much takeout from wonderful restaurants. Too much time for music and the general poetry of life. I get it. There are too many people who are suffering or will be, and for those we pray and hope. But as a country and a culture, we've been far too fat and happy for much too long. Time to rejoice in adversity, hunker down, cherish what matters, flatten the curve. Right, and Sweet. another one from Elizabeth Anderson. Uh, glad you're still doing the show. So are we. We need thoughtful discourse now more than ever. And Denise Janes Bischoff, sheltering in place, donating to the local fundraising to help those in need, and donate blood by appointment because it's a disinfected area. This is really, it's really changing your life, your workflow, your relationship with your daughter. It's uh, it's changing. Uh, my business. I mean, we we kind of our summer is wiped out, and um, not we're not alone. It's changing everybody's life and business. There's a lot of anxiety. I feel it. I know you do. The studio is as dark as I've ever seen it when I walked in today. Uh, a lot of my uh, performances and and lectures and so on have been canceled. I have good news, however. Uh, the Summer Lewis and Clark tour is on. Well, good. Those who are coming, we, you, know, you may need to drive to Great Falls. I don't think so. I think the planes will be up and running by then. But we're doing it in the safest place to be in the world uh, for 10 days in July. 
uh, is on the Lewis and Clark Trail. Yeah, that would be tragic if that didn't happen. That's, it will happen, that would and be I urge a, people to a mark in time. Uh, and then the the winter encampments next year at Loxaw Lodge are still on. Uh, one is already full. That's the one on J. Robert Oppenheimer and the, and the building of the atomic bomb. The other one on Thoreau and Walden. Yeah, but beyond that, I mean, your your life <laughs> your life is based around performance and public appearances and so many things you do, and that's just. That's just gone. For the moment, it is. So to that end, I'm, I'm creating an online course, David. Really? I'm going to do a bunch of them now, but I'm going to do an online course, and it'll be up and running on the website here shortly, but it's going to be on pandemics, and we're going to read several great books in the history of pandemics, Boccaccio's Decameron, um, Daniel Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year, which is about the plague in 1665. We're going to read The Andromeda Strain by Michael Crichton. Uh, there will be others, perhaps. We're going to read a series of classics about this, which will allow us to to sort of filter our concerns, hopes, anxieties, fears through the humanities, which is exactly why we have the humanities. And so there will be a series of online courses. There will be a fee, but it won't be exor- exorbitant. And I hope that people who are interested in the humanities and have been wanting kind of the book club that they never really have had that we can form this in the next few weeks. Plus, the Cuba trip is still on for next February, and the Steinbeck trip is still on for next March. So my view is everything is going to be fine, but the disruptions are going to be um, gigantic. And it just has to be said, uh, my life is going to be fine, your life is going to be fine, but I think of all the people who work in the in the food service industry, the the first responders in the healthcare industry, uh, the taxi drivers, the, you know, the the people who's yeah, it's a lot of individual uh, stories. A lot of Americans, millions and millions and millions of them, live pretty close to the bone on paying their rent, making their car payment, putting food on the table, getting their children uh, to school or or to daycare, and that's where my my heart is, you know, my head is, we will get through this. But I'm thinking there's not a household in this country where there is not a series of emergency conversations occurring about disruption. It's like a great equalizer. Do you have a pencil still? Uh, and there's more, B- because I wanted to pass this on to you. You had talked about your online reading of the books, and we got a, an email from uh, Mike Schmidt. Another plague book. He said, today I heard you talk about Stephen King's The Stand, probably not a recommended read right now, and Daniel Defoe's A Journal of the Plague here. Uh, There is yet another in this genre called Earth Abides by George R. Stewart. It was published in 1949 and is another take on the few survivors of a killing disease. There are no supernatural factors and the characters are just normal people. So I thought you might want to Put that on your list. Oh, that's a good one. And also, of all people, Mary Shelley, The Last Man. Right, I got a copy a of that. You Which do. You, a, yeah, you, I think you can buy it for a buck or two. It's, so there's, know. I mean, there's a classic of pandemic literature, which I'm intending to read. I've, I've never read it. This online course, how soon will that start? It'll start in April, so imminently. If people want to find out, this is news to me. They should so go to the Jefferson Hour site where there will be information. Com. Right, yeah, and so okay. there will be a, several of them. The first one is going to be on the pandemic, because guess why? You know, A, the literature is rich, but B, this helps us. This helps us. I watched Contagion last night, David. Oh, you should. <laughs> no, but it, it's an important. It's important to watch. It's and, a really good movie. Great cast. And it helps, you know. And, and boy, does it track with this thing. China, uh, bats, uh, it, amazing. But the the death rate is much higher, and there's more social breakdown. Of course, we're really in the the beginnings of all of this. But the second course is one that I've been wanting to do for a long time. It's going to be called the Enlightenment. You know, a lot of people. Th- hear me talking all the time about the Enlightenment, but what is the Enlightenment, and who was involved, and what did it accomplish, and do we still need it? You know, there's the Steven Pinker book about Enlightenment. There's Homo Deus by Yuval Harari. So the second course will be maybe a a six-week or eight-week course on the Enlightenment 101, but using some of these fabulous texts that try to figure out why was the Enlightenment important and where are we now with respect to it in the 21st century? So these online courses, I think, are going to be a new revenue source, which is one reason to do them. But it's also a way of extending the humanities at a time when people need to be in their homes. Good for you. That's ambitious, sir. We need to take a short break. 
There's many voices from the Jefferson Hour that we need to get to. And I, I, when we come back, I want you to hear what Pat Brodowski from Monticello has to say. And David McCandry, didn't you talk with him? Yes, indeed. If you'd like to leave a comment, go to jeffersonhour.com. Click on Ask President Jefferson. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. And welcome back to the special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, the pandemic edition, or one of several, probably. You know, David, you spent a good deal of time over the past five days talking with some of our correspondents from around the country yeah, and around was, the world. It was somewhat selfish. It was kind of therapeutic for me, of course. I and want to hear your conversation with our friend, the gardener at Monticello, oh, yeah. Ms. Pat Bradowski. You know, if there's anybody who is self-sufficient and prepared for a pandemic it's her she Let me can play weave that. she can knit she can build she can dye indigo she can she can grind her own wheat to flour she can do anything hi um this is pat Bradowski. i'm the vegetable gardener at thomas jefferson's monticello and of course we've been closed uh, to the public since monday but it doesn't mean the gardeners don't have anything to do so we are working um every day but we stay six feet apart we have separate break times I'm lunching in my car. Um, we are getting a lot of, of spring planting done, which is great. Um, and it's going to be absolutely beautiful when the public can return. And we also get some time to actually do some major construction and clearing and refurbishing the lawn, for instance, things that we can't usually do when, with the visitor traffic we have. So it's given us a little break in in that way. However, we have a lot of concerns because Everyone has uh, people at home that they want to protect. And so we have some members in our staff who are deciding to stay home. I fortunately live in isolation anyway, so I don't have uh, that problem yet. My daughter's boyfriend works at the hospital and delivered a package to the person who did have it. And so he is now in isolation, self-quarantine, because they're really um, worried that he might come down with it. And then um, everyone has these stories. And so basically it's kind of like, well, it's, you know, be prepared, be safe, be smart. And, um, and the spring weather is up on us. It's a really great time to be outside. I've got one friend who's going to take a hike with a friend, but they're going to stay apart and they're going to have lunches apart, but at least they can shout to each other. (laughs) So there, there is, there are opportunities, but it is a stressful time, and unless you're an outdoor worker like we are. So uh, I hope the best for everyone. Isn't that great? That's Pat. Pat is such a, a wonderful person. Her her spirit is always cheerful. Of course they were using this time to do improvements and get ahead. There's another one that I would really like to play for you. I had a chance to talk with Scott Davis. He's the Commissioner of Indian Affairs here in the state of North Dakota. He's a Lakota Ojibwe man. But, yeah, from Turtle Mountain. Right. And uh, he's also part of the governor's task force. So um, let, me, let me play that for you. Good. Scott Davis here with the North Dakota Affairs Commission, proud member of the Santa Rosa Tribe and the center of the Trauma on Ben Chippewa. I'm currently a cabinet member for Governor Burgum. Interesting times we have going on right now for everybody, but being part of the, uh, the unified commander under Governor Burgum, I can't say enough on how impressed I am with the unified commander that the governor has assembled from the uh, medical communities, the private sector, uh, the government sectors, uh, the access to people in BC, the CDC, and so forth. So we're going to continue to do that based on fact and science. The other piece I think is very, very important, obviously, for me as a tribal member is, um, you know, our constant day-to-day updates with the tribes. These are the real-time updates, uh, questions, concerns. We want to be in sync with that so that we have services for our elders or children. As a tribal member, an elder reminded me that last night in Cannonball, they had a district meeting. And it was really some encouraging words for me personally. He he reminded us that we've been through these things before. We've been through worse. If there's any one nation or people in this in this United States that's been through these things, and honestly, worse, it's been the Native American people. He says, so take courage, take courage. And when these storms come, we as tribal nations always put our head down. We face the storm and we uh, move forward. So that was very very uh, encouraging. And just reminded me of how strong we are as uh, Native American people in the state. 
and we will get through this. Well, Governor Burgum comes from the tech uh, sector of the economy. He's very well networked around the country. He went to Stanford Business. Uh, he's a he's a, a good person to be the governor of North Dakota when you need to get the attention of the CDC or the the best experts from around the country and around. Yeah, isn't the world. that great to hear that our state how well they're working together and you know it makes me feel very very good. It does, of course. We're one of the most lightly populated states uh, per square mile in the country, and so we have some advantage over um, conurbations like New York or Los Angeles or the or the Bay Area or Detroit or Chicago. Um, I'm really glad to hear from Scott Davis uh, that there has not been a, a, a big outbreak on the reservations because uh, that's a world where uh, it's, it's somewhat less connected um, than some other parts of, of North Dakota and the United States, and it's a population that, that on the whole lives pretty close to the poverty line. And so uh, we all know that this epidemic is going to have a, a, a greater impact on, on the poor uh, and people in, in economically marginal communities than it's going to have on the middle class end up. Yeah, and his, his main concern is elders and, and children. Uh, there's, a, you know, of course, a high, very high incidence of, of uh, diabetes on the reservation, respiratory diseases. So that's a, that's a population that we really need to be very careful to protect as we go forward. Uh, there is one other gentleman that we should hear from this week. I, I'm going to propose to you that we extend this program to next week because there's so many, there's con- so many contributors. Voices. Yes. Yeah. Um, but that would be Chrysler. Not Chrysler. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, is he composed a song or what, no, what not, exactly? No, no, not yet. Yeah, no, great. It's... You picked a pine time to infect me. It's a great message from Brad. Brad Chrysler down in Nashville, and I hope you guys are doing well. Uh, I'm enjoying listening to the show's uh, during our our self quarantine, uh, it's it's kind of great because we have the whole family here. You know, two students that are home uh, from school, and uh, we're just trying to find out what our new normal is as a family. We're making routines. We're having family meetings. We're stocked pretty well, and uh, we're just trying to check on our neighbors and leave our numbers uh, and on cards at our neighbors' doors. To, uh, we have some older neighbors, and we're just trying to be as good a neighbors as we can, give us each other as much grace and compassion as we can as we try to figure this thing out. And we're spending some time as a family praying for those who are sick and praying for those people who are struggling more than we are. And, uh, we hope hope for the best and are thinking of you guys. Please keep recording if you can and uh, giving us hope, giving us a Jeffersonian perspective. We're all in need of that for always, uh, always. And, um, and just um, everybody out there, stay safe. Wash your hands. <laughs> wow, Chrysler. No, don't you feel bad for making fun of no, him? No, <laughs> because you know he's just. I just want to hear the. I want to hear the tune in the in the manner of uh, Patsy Cline. Well, he all you know he has a pretty nice thing to say. Keep or encouraging us to keep recording. No, he, you know, and, wanna, and we will. Can we I will. say of Chrysler that he and I have been corresponding? Oh, good. And I wrote to him because I believe this is the time when you need to say to the people that you care about in the world how you feel about them. Not because we're all going to die, but because this reminds us that that life is fragile and that you don't really ever get a chance to say the things you want to say to the people who have marked your life. And I, so I wrote to Chrysler and I said to him, which I mean, that he is an extremely remarkable human being. You know, he, he paints miniatures, he collects, he's become a serious collector of miniature paintings. He's a gifted and extremely talented songwriter. He, he reads incessantly. He's skeptical about the things that, that pass through our world, but skeptical with a high level of good sense, humor, and intelligence. And he's pretty well grounded, too. He's very well grounded. So, uh, you know, he can kick me vaccine through the goalpost of life as far as I'm he, concerned. He's one of the only uh, drop-in visitors ever to make it to the barn and out again. So he, he's he got status. <laughs> he does have status, and, and he has never betrayed um, the location of the barn. 
Well, we have a bunch more calls. Next week, we're going to hear from Russ Eagle, Bo Wright, Rick Kennerly, David Nicandri, Joe Ellis, Brad uh, from Brooklyn. In fact, let's take a listen to what Brad had to say. All right. This is Brad Moore calling from Brooklyn, New York. This is in response to your request for information about how the coronavirus is impacting various communities. Uh, Here in New York, the coronavirus' impact has definitely affected daily life here, but the city is still moving. It is certainly much quieter, though. People are taking health precautions seriously and staying home. People understand that we all have a responsibility to help stem the spread of the virus. Face masks are are ubiquitous. Working remotely is the norm and will continue indefinitely. On the whole, people are behaving in a civil and concerned manner. With regard to the government's response, there are talks about a 48-hour shelter-in-place order. This strikes me as overly cautious, but I understand why the city government is acting like they are. New York's population and population density present a unique challenge in the United States. My concern is that this extreme caution will have a severe financial impact on hourly workers and small businesses, with people least equipped to deal with an economic downturn. Uh, on a completely different subject, Mr. Jenkinson, I'm glad to hear that you had a wonderful visit to my native Richmond. Thank you for all that you do. I loved my time in Richmond. The Capitol there and the pedestrian statue of George Washington are just magnificent. And uh, it seems like a long, long, long time ago now. But I'm so glad for all of these contributions to our understanding of the way the people who listen to the Jefferson are reacting around the United States and abroad. Thanks for doing this, David. It's a, it's a community service. Well, thank you. And uh, we will have more of these next week. But right now, sir, it is time for this week's Jefferson Watch. My dear friends, we will get through this. I hope together. Follow all the guidelines about hand washing, social distancing, limiting contact with others, and assume that you are a carrier of the coronavirus even if you are not. If we all show great discipline and make a shared sacrifice now, we will come through this sooner, perhaps, than we think. I have some recommendations for all of us during what is going to be one of the most trying times of our lives. If you have the space for it, even a small space, plant a garden this year. I never have enough time to weed. Now I do. The virus hates heat and sun. I'm going to try to produce my best garden ever this summer. This time it really matters. I may need the food. Gardens are a perfect Jeffersonian therapy in a time of tension, angst, fear, and frustration. I agree with Jefferson that we become saner and more serene when we have our hands in the soil. Those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God, he wrote. I've been gathering my seeds and thinking of the parable of the mustard seed from Matthew 13, 31, 32. Many Americans are filling their time by binge-watching television series. In fact, the gatekeepers of the web are worried that the high bandwidth demands of video will slow the Internet to a crawl or maybe even crash it altogether. I understand that a series like Homeland or West Wing is today what a serialized Charles Dickens novel was in England in 1850, but I want to make a suggestion that I know will resonate with you because you are Jefferson Hour listeners. This is a perfect time to read those books you have been intending to read for the last many years and never quite get to. I'll confess my own big reading gaps in the hopes that you will follow suit. Write to us at the Jefferson Hour to make your own confessions and to voice your resolutions. I have never finished The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky, even though it is considered his best novel and is always in lists of the top ten novels ever written by anyone. In fact, I don't think I've ever gotten halfway through it. The Pavir translation is outstanding. I'm going to see this through this time. I've gotten to about page 400 a couple of times, but work and travel and meetings and conference calls and life keep getting in the way. And if this lockdown lasts long enough, I'm going to finish Tolstoy's War and Peace, this time for sure. And I have a scholarly reason to read Milton's Paradise Lost. During this quarantine, each of us can take on those books that we know we will be glad when we have read them, and probably never we're going to read them otherwise. I also urge you to write some letters in the next weeks and months. They can be electronic if necessary, but let them be the true old-fashioned letters and not just dashed off notes. Write them to the people you love, of course, but also to the people you cherish, the people you respect, 
the people you care about, the people that lift you up, the people who have made the difference. Probably no one you know is going to die in this pandemic, but we cannot be certain of that. And this is a perfect time to express love and friendship and gratitude and devotion. Dr. Johnson once said, knowing you are to be hanged in a fortnight concentrates the mind wonderfully. I've been writing to the people I cherish. Some are long texts, others are electronic letters, and some are actual printed letters. And you know what? It makes me feel great. I feel human again. In the last few months, I have reconnected by letter with one of my closest friends ever. We studied at Oxford University together. He's an important philosopher now, one of the most brilliant minds I have ever known. It feels like a miracle to me that we could reconnect after 30 years. We must not die, said John Adams, until we have explained ourselves to each other. The correspondence, especially now, has given me great happiness. No man is an island. We are all products of family, friends, mentors, teachers, associates, and even adversaries. We need to answer the network of this pandemic with the network that defines our lives and our character. You know that greeting card that says, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? Now is the time to give a couple of hours per day to the guitar, or wood turning, or learning Spanish, or crocheting. In his important book, Homo Deus, Yuval Harari argues that humans stay stuck because they don't feel confident that they could do well enough at something, when in fact it is precisely that lack of confidence that is the only real impediment. I'm never going to be a worldwide classical ukulele phenomenon, but I can probably get good enough to bring some pleasure to my life, and possibly even to others. If you come out of this enforced sabbatical without having done that thing you've always said you were going to do if you had enough time on your hands, it means you never really meant to do it. Pick up your bed and walk. I also advise you to keep a journal. This is one of those macrocosmic experiences that nobody is ever going to forget. This is the Kennedy assassination, the Challenger disaster, and 9-11 on steroids. The English naval clerk Samuel Pepys kept a journal for 10 years between 1660 and 1670. It is a splendid piece of writing. Thanks to my father, I have all 13 volumes. Among other things, he witnessed the restoration of the Stuart monarchy under Charles II, the Great Fire of London, and the last great plague in English history in 1665. I'm keeping a double journal, partly on this laptop, but partly in longhand on a bunch of old yellow legal pads I found the other day while cleaning the garage. I note the daily death toll. It tolls for thee, and it tolls for me, and I chart my wild mood swings from complacent optimism to fear and loathing. I strongly urge you to do the same. Your journal may be important to future historians. How did they do during the Great Plague of 2020? And what did they do? This plague is going to end sooner than we think, so let's get started now. I'm Clay Jenkinson. We'll see you next week for another important edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thank you.